Hello, everyone. My name is David McLeod, and I am your Life Mastery Coach and best-selling lead author of the new book, Gifts of Wisdom, Practices for Healing and Empowerment, which is now available on Amazon at the link below. Welcome to my chapter reading series for this book, in, in which you get to meet each author and listen in during a personal reading of that person's entire chapter from this amazing and beautiful little book. Today, my guest is Denise Lefevre, who contributed Chapter 5. Denise is a certified yoga therapist who holds additional certifications in I Rest, I Am, Yoga Nidra, and Chair Yoga and Chair Yoga Dance. She is also a diabetes prevention program lifestyle coach through the University of Virginia. Welcome, Denise, and thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, David. Honored to be here. Well, you know, I'm honored to have you as part of the team, this, this amazing author team that came together for this book. Um, I wondered if you can just take a moment and share with the audience what it is that inspired you to join this collaborative book project. Well, it's probably serendipity. Um, I received an email from you and then we jumped on a phone call and um, it just felt right. And I'm not somebody that necessarily moves according to how something feels, but the timing was perfect. I've always wanted to write a published book, um, but I just had so many life, life interventions that this seemed a good way to start with that process. Yeah, and I know you and I have shared some of this before uh, in other contexts. It's been, your life has been a, you know, kind of a challenge in many ways, hasn't it? Yes, it has. I mean, and, in good ways, bad ways. <laughs> of course, of course. And of course, that's what led you into this whole yoga uh, passion in the first place. Am I right? That's correct. It was but the my second go round really came down to my own personal health issues and then health issues within my family. Right, right. Yeah. Well, so why don't you tell tell us just briefly in an overview, tell us a little bit about how your chapter came into being and, and, you know, a little bit about what you wrote about. Why, why were you inspired to write what you wrote? Um, yoga Nidra has revisited me throughout my interest in yoga, and I never was quite sure why. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it came across when I started to think about what I was going to write about. First of all, I did not think it was going to be this topic. It kind of came about, um, I had a call with Laura. Laura actually suggested the title, and I realized that this is the theme that has brought me the most calm and peace throughout all of my dabbling in, in the yoga practices I've been involved in. And then during the pandemic, because so many other people were feeling anxiety and uncertainty, I actually started a donation-based yoga nidra, both with um, cancer patients and those that did not have cancer. And the response was overwhelming. So it's, to me, a, a, a simple practice that's accessible to anybody. And you don't have to listen to me. There's plenty of other people that record these. So um, I just like the fact that anybody can tune into this kind of meditation and not have to put a lot of effort into feeling better. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I think with all of that, it's time we heard you read your chapter, don't you think? And yes. so, friends, I'm going to ask you to give your full attention now to Denise Lefevre as she reads Chapter 5, Yoga Nidra, An Intention to Relax and Ease the Mind. The more we can develop a healthy relationship with all parts of life, not just the parts we like or want to experience, the better off we'll be. We need to learn not just how to feel good, but also how to get comfortable with feeling bad. Kamini Design. My story. The stomach churn is relentless. Suppose my college board scores are a disaster. I'll never get into college. I'm not as smart as my classmates. Palms moist with sweat, tears on the brink of spilling over. Why am I a complete failure? I'll never amount to anything. My 16-year-old head chatter was overwhelming, crippling at times. Fortunately, 
My astute mother intervened. After listening to my worries, she said, you'll have a nervous breakdown if you don't stop fretting. The school offers a beginner's yoga class in the adult evening program. Sign up. In 1970, the fall of my junior year, I walked into an evening yoga class in the gym. Everyone was older than me. I searched for an unoccupied corner of the room. Slowly, my awkward body moved to instructor-directed stretches, twists, and new shapes. Simple movements felt surprisingly good. I moved with ease. In no time at all, the movement practice was over. We were asked to lie down for relaxation. The teacher guided us. Tune into your breath. Imagine you're on a sunny beach. The hard, polished wooden gym floor transitioned to a soft powder white beach. My body relaxed into the sand image. My breath is deep and cold, calm. Golden sunlight is warming my face. I feel the warmth spread through my whole body. I smell the salt air. I hear waves crashing on the shore. I am relaxed. The visualization was over in less than 10 minutes. My mind chatter was silent. After one class, the impact on my body sensations was subtle, but the impact on my mental and emotional state was profound. I was hooked. College boards were looming, but my tummy and mind were calm. I continued with the beginner class and added a yoga philosophy and breath meditation class. These practices didn't get rid of my adolescent mind chatter, but worry didn't cripple me as often. My practice was personal and private. None of my friends practice yoga. Yoga became my secret coping weapon. Life continued. Uncertainty created more mind chatter. My college board scores aren't great, but I received a college acceptance letter. I don't wanna go. I'm not ready for college. I'll flunk out, do drugs, or become an alcoholic. Tears and worry took over my senior year despite my ongoing yoga and meditation practice. Take a gap year, my parents suggested. I need to test my independence before I experience unsupervised peer pressure in college. I spent a gap year with family friends in London and worked as a mother's helper. I breathed and meditated. My secret practice throughout my 20s, continued to ease my mind chatter as I faced life decisions. However, a literature and foreign language degree didn't help me find work in a competitive job market. I want to be a writer, but I'll never be able to support myself as a writer. Who's going to hire a liberal arts graduate and pay me enough so I can live on my own? I want to travel the world and meet interesting people from different cultures, and I don't even speak languages that well. Yoga kept me balanced as I hopped through minimum wage jobs every year. Finally, a family member helped me land a job as a French English translator, clerk typist, and a leading aerospace and defense contractor under contract with the Tunisian government. I swapped English for basic electronic tutoring with about a dozen Tunisian military personnel undergoing technical training at the company. Noting my rapport with the company's customers, my boss encouraged me, you should attend business school. We'll cover the tuition. As I began my MBA, the project ended. I was laid off. I looked for work and I continued my part-time MBA studies. My savings were being depleted. I found a job with a small niche aerospace company. The smaller size created a greater learning opportunity. I interacted with fascinating international customers. I loved the work, but the work environment was overly demanding. Mom came to the rescue once again. I've just learned about a place called Kripalu in Massachusetts. Go there for a yoga retreat. I think you need it. I started to feel successful at my job, but my rumination continued. I'm 30, getting old and fat. Why can't I meet a nice guy and settle into a normal life? 
No one will ever love me. Guys just don't understand my international interest or work schedule. I travel internationally and meet new people, but I'm paid much less than all the men. They seem to find time for vacation. Why can't I get all my work done? I'll be a clerk for the rest of my life. I don't want to end up as a bag lady. One day, I told my boss, I'm taking a spa vacation in New England to work on losing weight. He'll understand a fat farm self-improvement break much better than a yoga retreat. My lifestyle was taking a toll on my waistline. At Kripalu, I signed up for a workshop called Inner Quest Intensive. It delivered intense inner work. The silent retreat guided us to connect with ourself through deep meditation. The participants were nothing like my work colleagues. I judged them as touchy feely hippies who vocally expressed and experienced every emotion as they moved and meditated. Based on the noisy emotional outburst from the hippie participants, intensive questing, questing happened all around me. I tried to ignore the moans and groans and went deeper into myself. I thought this was a silent retreat. Ignore them. I don't belong here. I'm not enough. I'm not happy. Why am I here? That guy sounds like he's in real pain. I'm not like all these other people. Will I ever find love? I grew up in a stable, loving family. Why am I so miserable? On day two, the guided meditation encouraged us to meet our spirit guide and listen to its wisdom. I reserved my judgments about spirit guides and focused on my breath. My breath is slowing down, getting deeper. An image of a pristine white sandy beach along a Caribbean blue surf appears. As I wade through the surf, my feet are wet but warm. In the distance, I see a lean, attractive woman about my age with short, curly brown hair. The ocean breeze blows softly against her long white dress as it billows in the wind. She splashes through the water's edge and heads towards me. Hi, I'm Miranda, she greets me. I want you to know that you are enough. Your discontent is valid, but it's temporary. You will find your way. She touches my chest and a golden white light floods my being. I feel a charge of healing energy. I'm rejuvenated and entirely at ease. I emerge from the meditation feeling transformed and lighter. I float it to the evening meal. In my mind, Miranda meant seeing from the Spanish word mirar, which translates as to look at, watch, or pay close attention to. At dinner, others in the class remarked that my face was transformed, serene, and peaceful. I knew there was a profound shift. I left the retreat, vowing to leave my work environment. I took a new job with a Fortune 500 aerospace company. I began to accept that all that the right relationship with another may not happen. I decided to believe Miranda's words. I am enough. I didn't need anyone else. My career became my focus. I had no career objective other than to learn and experience as much as possible. Over the next two decades, the company I joined transferred me to four different locations and merged many times. I also met my love. My career and family became my priorities. Miranda and my yoga practices became a distant memory. My company measured our progress by how well we achieved our annually stated goals. Goal achievement led to increased opportunity and pay. These goals defined our desired position in the company. I resisted stating what I wanted to achieve. My boss insisted I name it, director or vice president. Doubt returned. I'm not qualified for this job. They needed a woman in this management position to meet their quotas. 
I don't have the technical background to do this work. It's not just my job at state now. There's a team counting on me. I'm not a leader. I'm going to let them down. Ben and Jerry's fish food or chubby hubby medicated my state of mind. Physically, I wasn't well. I started exercising. I maintained a similar frantic cardiac racing pace in my exercise regimen that I applied to my job. The pounding on the treadmill took its toll. Foot problems, which were first diagnosed after a racquetball induced stress fracture in my 30s, were no longer responding to holistic treatments. You need foot surgery on both feet, the doctor told me. In 2004, I was confined to bed for several weeks as I healed from toe fusion surgery on my right foot. At the same time, another company merger meant more organizational change at my job. I called into daily meetings with my boss from my bedside office to brainstorm the future organizational structure. He suggested that I move from my location in New York State to corporate offices in DC. He agreed to wait to make the change until I healed from my foot surgery. Transitioning from a rural, relatively small business unit to a major metropolitan corporate office was more stressful than anticipated. Now in my 50s, I was excited by the challenge, but the traffic, housing prices, and cost of living overwhelmed me. Shortly after we sold our house in New York and found a new one almost four times the cost in Virginia, my boss told me he was leaving the company. Corporate began to consolidate functions, reorganize, and downsize. My new colleagues and I speculated about our futures. I joked, each workday is like an episode on the TV show Survivor. Who's going to get voted off the island? We started creating plots for a reality, reality TV show to amuse ourselves during persistent organizational rumors. Driving home from work one evening, I received a call from my doctor. Your blood work is in. I want to meet you tomorrow in person. You have type 2 diabetes, she clinically announced the next day. We're going to put you on metformin right away, and I want you to focus on losing weight. I'll follow up with you in 30 days. I was stunned. This had to be a mistake. The following month, my doctor consulted her notes. You also need blood pressure and cholesterol medications. I looked at her and the tears flowed freely. What's wrong? I've never been on prescription medications. Is this my life now? I sobbed. She sharply responded without empathy. You should feel thankful that we have drugs to treat this. In the past, people got complications and died. Her bluntness and guidance not to eat mangoes are all I remember from my initial diagnosis. I studied my condition and managed it as best I could. I knew that in addition to eating healthy foods, exercise was necessary. My foot problems meant changing my treadmill pounding exercise, so I joined a yoga studio. After sharing the latest imagined survivor plot with my coworkers, I rushed to the studio during rush hour traffic. I was on edge, a tense spring, getting ready to break. I chuckled to myself, something's not right if you're stressed out going to a yoga class. The yoga style was gentle, but movement and stillness were more difficult than in my 30s. Grief overcame me. We moved into the final relaxation pose. I couldn't relax. My mind raced, my body was tight. I can't get my body to relax. What happened to me? My movements don't flow. My body used to move smoothly. It's now jerky and tight. Tears began to leak out. I'm holding tension everywhere. Where is the ease that I once knew? I persisted with a weekly practice. My left foot pain was excruciating. I shopped doctors in the area to find one who also worked with type 2 diabetes patients. I knew my age and condition had the potential for complications. I found a well-known doctor who performed my third foot surgery. At home, after the surgery, the pain medication didn't work. 
This is worse than the previous ones. My bones throb. The pain is radiating from my toes up my leg. I'm so tired. I can't sleep. I can't find a comfortable position. I can't look at the metal rods coming out of my toes. I'm sleepy. I hurt. Something is wrong. My husband empathized with my pain. He asked to remove the bandage and check it out. The second toe was very swollen and had turned a dark blue black. He called the doctor who agreed to see me right away. Oh, that doesn't look good. What do you think happened? What do I think happened? You're the goddamn doctor. I think you're going to lose that toenail at best. I'll try to save the toe, but I can't promise anything. You won't be able to play golf or do yoga again. Miserable. I returned home, lay in bed, and felt sorry for myself. I'm too young to feel so old. I can live without golf, but not yoga. When was the last time I felt okay? As I drifted off into a painkiller induced nap, Miranda appeared. Now might be a good time to deepen your yoga studies. I woke up with a hazy memory of meeting Miranda and sent a note to my yoga teacher. I want to learn more about yoga, but do not want to teach, I caveated. Two months later, I returned to work. A change in CEOs meant another restructuring. In January 2020, I sat in a chair wearing a surgical boot in a yoga studio and began a 300 hour yoga teacher training program. I was the class's oldest, heaviest, tightest woman. I gradually found balance physically, mentally, emotionally. Six, six months later, I took an early retirement package from my corporate job. Thanks to Miranda, I continue to live in balance, do yoga, read, learn, relax, and enjoy new experiences with less intense mind chatter. Within you, there is a stillness and a sanctuary to which you can retreat at any time and be yourself. Herman Hesse, Siddhartha. The practice. Yoga Nidra, or yogic sleep, is a profound guided meditation technique that connects you to yourself. I am Yoga Nidra, developed by Kamini Desai, PhD, is a version of the practice I experienced at Kripalu. Yoga Nidra invites us to set an intention. For some, an intention may suggest an action-oriented goal. This is not the case. Its purpose is to encourage a positive state of being. The intention may appear in images, words, or a present tense sentence expressing a quality you wish to experience. As an example, perhaps you have anxiety or worry. The intention is positive. I approach my day with peaceful confidence, not I will not worry, I won't be anxious. Being peaceful and confident may help you to achieve a goal, but it's not necessary to accomplish it. It can be difficult for someone new to this practice to develop an intention spontaneously. To help get comfortable with intention setting, I've created the following mudra or hand gestures and breath practice. It can be done standalone or before yoga nidra. If any aspect of this practice makes you feel uneasy, it may be a chance for self exploration or you may pause the practice. You can go to the YouTube link in the chapter for a video of this practice. We start first with Dhyana Mudra, gesture of med meditation. Find a comfortable seated position. Gently close your eyes. Arrange your body so the right palm is on the left facing up. The thumbs are slightly lifted, tips are touching. Allow the hands to rest on your lap or near your navel. Take a few breaths. Inhale through the nose. Exhale through the mouth as though blowing out a candle. Repeat five times. Notice what thoughts or images arise. Allow your breath 
to return to its natural rhythm. Number two, Kaputa Mudra, the gesture of the dove. Bring your palms together at the heart, but hold them slightly away from the body. Gently bend the knuckles to create a space between the palms. The fingertips, thumbs, and base of the palms are touching. Breathe normally. Notice what, if any, images or words appear. You may feel a sense of peace. Maybe an intention forms. It's okay if it doesn't. Repeat the intention to yourself three times. Anjali Mudra, gesture of reverence. Bring the palms together. Allow the thumbs to press against the sternum. Repeat the intention three times. Feel it in the heart center. Breathe. Notice what arises. Last, Padma Mudra, gesture of the lotus. With the hands in Anjali Mudra, move the index finger, middle finger, and ring finger away from each other so your hand forms a lotus flower. With an open heart and hands, feel the breath flow from the belly to the throat as you raise your hands up and overhead. Your intention blossoms like the lotus flower. Repeat your intention once silently and then bring the palms back together into Anjali Mudra. Allow them to rest at your heart center for a few breaths. Breathe and notice how you feel. When you feel ready, you may open your eyes. Wow, what a what a beautiful chapter, Denise. I just want to say thank you so much for sharing that. I found myself, you know, on the edge of tears in a couple of places and also kind of laughing out loud here and there. You know, there you, you manage to maintain a really positive energy and a sense of humor, you know, when 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 things are getting bad for you and I I really admire that because that takes a lot of courage. So I want to say thank you for that. How do you feel you. now after having read the the chapter? Um it's funny because after I wrote it I didn't read it for a while. So the act of reading it aloud um, was very profound. Mm -hmm. And especially, uh, especially doing the practice. Um, you know, it was something that I found in my own time of returning to Yoga Nidra when you're so tense, being able to slow down, you need practices like that to help bring your heart and mind together so that you can then get into that deeper experience. So thank you for allowing me to articulate it. Oh, well, you're welcome. And thank you for, for, for doing that. I mean, it's really beautiful, touching, heartfelt, and, and magnificent. You know, what can I say? It's, it's great. Thank you. you. Know, and I also, uh, you know, you mentioned that one of the reasons that you wanted to do this is you wanted to write. And wow, you've got a gift for writing too, so. Oh. <laughs> Make my heart sing. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. And so, friends, this is just one example of some of the fantastic and inspiring material that's available in this book, Gifts of Wisdom. If you haven't already purchased a copy, or if you'd like to consider gifting your friends with a copy of the book, please head over to our Amazon book page. And again, I've included the link below. Also, if you'd like to connect with Denise Lefevre directly, you can reach out to her on her website at https colon slash slash lavenderomwellness.com. I've got that link on the screen as well. So please reach out, say hello. Thank you all for stopping by. I hope to see you again for some of the other videos in this series. I wish you love, light, and blessings on your continuing journey. Bye-bye for now.